Ignition switch is on. Start in port outer now. Any conflict in your mind between the role of warrior and of carer? I, I can't see the conflict. I know that people do see a conflict. How is it you once destroyed, now you're building? But each generation has got to work for peace in its own historical context. Mine happened to be war. To me, the point is that every generation is longing for peace. That's the perennial longing of the human heart. In some sense, sorry, in ways then, that you were a reluctant warrior. I wasn't reluctant by the time it came to 1939. Geoffrey Leonard Cheshire was born in 1917. He grew up near Oxford. His father was a professor of law and it was expected Leonard would follow in his legal footsteps. He went to Oxford, just like his father. He took a degree in law, just like his father. But Leonard was not made for the courtroom. His sights were set higher. In 1936, Leonard joined the University Air Squadron. He learned how to fly. The skies over Europe were darkening, however. Soon, Leonard's new skills would face the greatest test imaginable. The undisciplined university student became one of Britain's best pilots. By 1943, Leonard was the youngest group captain in the RAF. He would go on to lead the 617 Squadron the unit behind the famous Dambuster raids. Under Leonard's command, the elite squadron developed daring new bombing techniques, which delivered never-before-seen accuracy. Leonard insisted on flying as many missions as possible himself. He wasn't a natural pilot like some. He had to work hard, but he had the reputation for having luck on his side. And for the men that flew with him, maybe that was more important. I simply couldn't understand how you did it. Because you were so low in, in all that fire. And you seemed to know exactly what you were doing. And you told us exactly what to do. And it was an astonishing achievement of yours, that. How you ever survived it, of course, I don't know. You sounded as though you were sitting in an armchair just uh, chatting over what was to be done. Very precise, very calm. Well, of course, I felt safer. It, it looked dangerous from the top. It was dangerous, <laughs> Leonard. It's no good saying it looked dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> to survive, you have to be lucky, don't you? You do. And others were not. Fifty-five million people have died. Almost all those who were on my first flying training course didn't survive. And I thought, I've got a kind of duty to those who didn't survive, somehow to get involved in the struggle to help build, I don't know how to put it, a better peace, a better world. But I couldn't find a way. So I was disorientated. Leonard ended the war as one of the most decorated pilots in the Royal Air Force. He had won the Victoria Cross, the highest honour in the British Armed Forces. He had even been chosen by Churchill himself as the British observer of the nuclear bomb dropped on Nagasaki. 
But in some ways, the peace would be harder than war. He faced the same question as millions of other fighter men and women. What now? What life could be built in the shattered world that war had left behind? I then started a community to try and help ex-servicemen, those who'd served in the war and were finding it difficult to readjust themselves to peace. And in 1948, I found myself with a large property that I had bought, but unfortunately, that didn't succeed. Leonard was lost. All his plans had failed, and he was 18,000 pounds in debt. In the spring of 1948, he decided to sell up. The grand old house was to be carved up into flats and sold. But then Leonard got a phone call. It was from the local hospital. They needed his help. A veteran of the First World War, Arthur Dykes, was dying of cancer. He had no family to go to, and the hospital needed his bed for someone else. Did Leonard know of anywhere that Arthur could stay? It was one phone call, one decision, but it changed Leonard's life forever. So I called on the district nurse, and she said, oh, it's perfectly simple. I'll show you what to do. And so she gave me what she called a concentrated course of nursing in three evenings. And at the end of this operation, she said, you now turn to the patient and you say, are you comfortable? <laughs> well, I said, well, what happens if he says no? <laughs> she said, no patient would ever dare say that to a nurse. <laughs> And that, you thought, was going to be the end of it? Oh, I did, yes. I thought by that time I'd have settled my debts and gone off and started one of my schemes. But other things happened. Instead of one old man, there came another yes. and another and another. Yes, many. And uh, eventually the house filled up and uh, we got helpers and uh, the house became organised as a home for the sick. So there wasn't really a conscious decision. Now that nothing was further from my thought than starting at home. But of course, with 24 disabled people in the house, you can imagine that we were in a, to put it mildly, a muddle, because I had no idea how to run a house. By the end of 1949, there were 28 permanent residents at Lee Court. The Leonard Cheshire Charity was born. When they came to Lee Court, I found to my surprise that instead of wanting me to do everything for them, they wanted to do everything for themselves. In a word, they wanted to lead a life of their own choosing. At the same time that Lenny's charity was taking its first steps, so was the National Health Service. But with so many demands on the new NHS, Care for those with disabilities was a long way down the list of priorities. There was no room for them in hospital, and in society, they faced prejudice and discrimination. It was soon clear to Leonard that just one house wouldn't do. What he could offer at Lee Court was needed all over the country. What are you doing down that hole? We're trying to get that old house there habitable, actually trying to get some patients into it. In 1951, a second home, St. Teresa's, was established at an old RAF base in Cornwall, and Leonard had no plans to stop there. But he was so busy looking after others, he forgot about himself. And in August 1952, it all caught up with him. Leonard was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Then has spent the next two years in a hospital bed. When the doctor told me that I had TB and I was not going to leave the hospital even to collect my clothes and put me straight into bed, because a number of things started to happen rather quickly. The first naturally was that everybody came and said how sorry they were. In the same breath, they said, what are we going to do? Leonard was not used to doing nothing. 
Even in hospital at Midhurst, he tried to run the charity's growing network of homes from his sickbed. He had a tape recorder at his side, capturing all his ideas and orders. But he soon realized it was impossible. If the homes were to survive, he had to let others take on more of the work. I think that I learned a crucial lesson, but a difficult lesson. I realized that either I was going to have to let the homes go and see them collapse, or else I was going to have to hand everything over to the committees. I could no longer run it because I didn't know how long I was going to be in bed. Leonard left hospital in November 1954. He would feel the effects of his illness for years to come, but those long months living on a ward had only made him more convinced of his purpose in life. He returned to his work. By 1955, three more homes had been established in the UK, and Leonard's ambitions for the charity were about to grow even greater. I was wrestling in my mind with the problem of India. Dare I accept this invitation? It was, it was a tremendous step for me to take, although I look back on it with happiness now. I only had a total of £100 to take with me to India, and only one address out there. Leonard was joined on his journey east by his assistant, Margot Mason Gibb. We went off to India and started the first overseas Cheshire homes, camping out in tents and things in the jungle and getting huts built. You know, the snakes all around us and the, everything under the sun um, going wrong all the time. I think if I'd known what was coming, I probably would not have undertaken it. But uh, I felt this great uh, humanity in it amongst the Indian, and uh, I found this extraordinary willingness, this remarkable uh, ability to see the core of a problem. And once they saw the problem and a solution to it, they'd take it on. And I think I found this all over the world. The first Leonard Cheshire home outside Britain was opened in Mumbai on Christmas Day, 1955. It was called Bethlehem House. Leonard fell in love with India and returned whenever he could. But there was another reason the country would always be dear to him. It was there in 1959 that he married Sue Ryder. They shared the dedication to helping others. Sue ran a charity herself and their marriage was the beginning of a wonderful partnership in life and in work. One country sparks off another. It is growing one or two countries a year. Well, I hope they'll go on developing numerically where there's need. But more important, I just hope that we'll always be flexible, that we'll always be open to criticism and listen to it, and that uh, we'll lead the way. Expansion in one country soon led to another. By the end of the 1960s, the charity was active in 23 countries around the globe. Leonard Cheshire offered more than a home. Residents often had multiple illnesses and complex needs. The charity pioneered new forms of care, treating disabled people with dignity and respect. Despite everything he had achieved, Leonard was always a modest and private man. He turned down awards again and again, but even Leonard could not fight public recognition forever. He was awarded the Order of Merit by the Queen herself, and in 1978, he was presented with the Harding Award. I'm very much aware that although this beautiful and very symbolic award has been made to me personally. 
I am part of a great number of people and therefore I accept it on behalf of all those connected with our homes. I also accept it on behalf of others in so many other different ways who are working amongst disabled people, but also on behalf of disabled people themselves who are making such a contribution in their own way to the development and evolution of our society. When are you going to retire? I can't retire. I mean, it's my life. It's uh, Obviously, if I'm getting so muddle-minded that I'm making life difficult for people, then they'll have to push me to the background. I still won't retire. I still want to be involved. Uh, I still want to have my dreams, and uh, if I can't fulfill them myself, persuade other people to fulfill them. He was the most remarkable man of his generation in terms of giving an inspiration to people who met him. All, all types, he's not a ruler. He had this extraordinary gift. He, he, he always appeared quiet. He appeared quiet and all until you were with him. And then he accomplished quite extraordinary achievements both in wartime and in peacetime. In 1991, Leonard received a peerage and became Baron Cheshire of Woodall Spa. Just a few months later, he was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. During the ensuing months, he went to some lengths to assure everyone that he did not mind being disabled. He felt that instead of being on the outside of the world of disability looking in, he was now one of those for whom he had spent the best part of his life serving. Mind you, he didn't put it quite like that. His version was much humbler. Leonard Cheshire died at home in Cavendish on the 31st of July, 1992. He was 74. Tributes in Britain were led by the Prime Minister and the Queen but Leonard took lives far beyond his home. By the time of his death, his charity ran 270 homes, helping thousands of people in countries all over the world. One of Leonard's final acts was to establish the charity's archives, ensuring its story would be remembered, as of course would Leonard's own. One of the most extraordinary men of an, an extraordinary generation, he gave a lifetime of service, first to his country and then to the world. The Charity Today. Today, the Leonard Cheshire Global Alliance is a network of more than 200 independent organisations. It supports over 75,000 individuals in the UK and around the world. Every day, it carries the inspirational memory of Leonard and his values on. His bravery, his humility, his kindness, and his belief that diversity creates a world of possibility. Well, they've made, they've changed my whole life. I was entirely pulled by the great example of the disabled and the privilege, really, of being with them. My travel throughout the world have enabled me to meet people and know people I'd never have met otherwise, to learn new ideas. You, you, you realize your own ideas you thought were so good are not always so good. We need this involvement of the whole world, whatever nationality, whatever condition of the country. Each has got his own contribution to make and a realization that the tiny little drop makes up the ocean.
To find out more, visit rewind.leonardcheshire.org.